pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful day that you've given to us. And God, we gather together here today, uh, not just to admire your creation, Father, but to admire you. And so Lord, we gather to worship, we gather to praise, we gather to lift your name on high because you are so, so worthy of all of that. And Lord, as we come this morning, we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. We would worship you from the depths of our hearts for all that you've done for us, all that you are, all that you are going to do. And so, Father, we, we give this time to you. And Lord, we just, we open ourselves, we open our hearts, we open our minds. Lord, invade this place. Invade each one of us, Lord, draw us to yourself. And Father, as we leave this place today, help us to take those truths that you share with us and put them into practice in our hearts and in our lives that others, Father, would come to know you. As we learn to know you, help us to make you known. So Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Bless this service to your honor and your glory. We pray in Christ's name, amen. And we'll turn it over to our worship team.
from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From the throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Praise the That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now the gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son.
Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Well, with 
and good morning and Christian greetings to each one of you. I invite you to open your Bibles uh, to the book of Proverbs <clears throat> chapter 2 for our devotional this morning. The book of Proverbs chapter 2. I ask you the <clears throat> ask you the question this morning if uh, you run into a situation or a dilemma or a a question comes to your mind and you don't have the answer uh, where do you go uh, where do you go for an answer uh, and I can remember as a, as a young child uh, there there was a whole set of books in uh, on a bookshelf in my mom and dad's house that when we had a question, uh, mom and dad would say to us, well, go get the encyclopedia. Now, most of you young people probably don't even know what an encyclopedia is in written form, uh, but we had a whole set of Encyclopedia Britannica. Does that ring a bell, Encyclopedia Britannica, a whole set? Uh, when, when there was a question came up, we wanted to know about something, we went to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, for a few years, uh, my brother Brent and I, uh, we used those, uh, that, that set of encyclopedias pretty religiously for, for about three or four years. Uh, and what we did was we had uh, a set of matchbox cars, and, and we had a track. And uh, there was a, a, room, a window in our dining room on the back wall that had a little bit of a ledge on it, and we had a clamp that you could clamp on that ledge and hook your track onto it, which uh, made it about three foot high on that end. And then we'd extend the track all the way through the dining room and into the kitchen. And so we put our cars on there and they would zoom all the way down the track and into the kitchen. Well, that got kind of boring. Uh, after a while, they just zoom and would go and they had to go pick them up. So we decided we were gonna use the Encyclopedia Britannica's to make this a little more challenging. So we would go get the whole stack and we would stack some up and then we'd leave a spot where there weren't any, we'd make the track go like this. So for a few years we used the Encyclopedia Britannica quite religiously, but we didn't really learn a whole lot from it. Uh, it was exciting to use for our racetrack, but we really got nothing out of the books themselves. And I wonder sometimes if, you know, when it comes to gaining knowledge or gaining wisdom, gaining understanding, where, where we go and what we use, and we can even use the scriptures in the very same way. We, we come to the scriptures with sort of an idea or a concept, and then we use the scriptures to sort of prop up things that we want propped up and leave it out where we want things left out. And I think we need to guard ourselves against that. We use it in the same way that my brother and I use the encyclopedia. Britannica. We put it where we kind of wanted to. Proverbs chapter 2, the writer is, t is talking uh, about the scriptures and about wisdom. And I want us to read uh, the first uh, number of verses here. I think we'll go down to verse 9. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding... Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. As I mentioned when I was young and, you know, we had a question for my parents and it was something that we could look up in the encyclopedia, they would send us to the encyclopedia to, to look that up and to learn about that. And I've come to understand it as life has, has gone on, and I'm no longer young, a young child anymore. I don't consider myself old, but the, the questions that seem to come in life aren't always answered quite that easily. <laughs> you can't just go to the encyclopedia. You can't just Google every question that comes into your life. 
And so we need to go someplace that's going to give us good sound counsel, good sound advice, and, and that we can gain wisdom and understanding from. And God's word is that. God's word is that. But we need to receive it. We need to treasure it. We need to incline our ears to it. We need to apply our hearts to it. We need to, we need to cry out for it. We need to seek it. We need to search for it. It's not going to happen quickly. We live, we live in a society that everything has to happen quick. You just Google it. Ooh, and there it is. Well, not every situation can we just Google the answer. We need to spend time in the Word of God. We need to understand what He's saying to us. And, and God will give us that wisdom. He'll give us that discernment if we seek it and cry out for it. Let's pray this morning, shall we? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your Word. We thank you, Lord, for, for your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. And God, we, we, we seek that. We want to receive that. We want to understand that. Lord, help us to treasure your commands. Help us to incline our ears to your wisdom. Apply our hearts to the things that we read and understand in your word. To, to seek it and to search for it. And as we do that, Lord, that you will give us wisdom. You will give us discernment. You will help us to understand the path that you would have us to, to move on, to walk on. You will guard our paths. You will, you will give us an understanding of righteousness and justice and how to move forward. So God, help us, Lord, to be faithful to your word and faithful to you because we know, God, that you will be faithful to us. Lord, may you continue to lead and direct this service this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, praising thee their sum above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, blooming meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Well, spring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. El, our Father, Christ, our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father's love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music lifts us sunward in the triumph song of life. And then song number 49. <clears throat> song number 49. If you are willing, would you please stand for this song? This is my Father's world. 
and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair, in the rustling I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied in heaven and earth be one. Thank you. You may be seated.
Well, good morning. It is good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with His believers, with His family, and to be able to be here and bring uh, the Word of God to you this morning. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is the 13th message in this series through, thir- uh, through 1 Corinthians, and it is, uh, it's been a privilege and a joy to be able to study this book in depth and be able to bring these series of sermons to you as a church, and really the, the whole premise and focus of what we've been looking at uh, through this series is the imperfect church, perfect gospel theme. Um, we've seen pretty clearly uh, so far that the church in, in Corinth had a lot of issues, there's a lot of problems going on there. They had moral issues. They had uh, failure within the church. Uh, there was failure within the community. They were not being a light to the community. Uh, there was a whole list of things, and we we're only not even halfway through the book. Um, so we're going to see a lot more as we move through. But we've also seen the fact that that perfect gospel can still do amazing things. It can still transform lives, and it can still even use a church that isn't perfect for His glory and His good. So we've, we've looked at that throughout this series, and we've looked at some interesting things. And, and just the last time I brought a message in this series, uh, we looked at, in depth at uh, sexual immorality, uh, what that looks like, how we identify it as a church, and, and really some of the things that we can do, the steps that we can take uh, to recognize if we have an issue in our life, but also how we can gain freedom through the gospel, through Christ, um, and, and Lord willing, as the church leadership here continues to process through uh, the series that we're hoping to launch um, through the church as well, and through the accountability of the church. So we're looking forward to that, and in that message we dealt a lot with that. Well, Paul kind of moves into a different section, but at, at the same time he's, it, it's almost tying in to what we looked at just previously in chapter 6. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to look at the first nine verses this morning because we want to look at the topic of marriage and singleness. Marriage and singleness. And this isn't going to be the only time we address both of these topics within this chapter alone. But this kind of gives us a launching pad. Paul gives a launching pad for where he's going to go later on in this chapter. And as he moves through this, we see a thread woven throughout, but he establishes it right here in the first nine verses. So we're going to look at those first nine verses. So if you're there, please stand with me as we read the Word of God together as a church. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Paul writes, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control." Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself as I am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and to the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that this morning we can open it up, that we can dive into it, and we can glean from it the things that you want us to know, the things that you want us to change, and maybe even ways that you want to encourage us. We thank you, God, that your word is like a two-edged sword. It cuts deep into our heart and into our lives, and we pray for that this morning. Holy Spirit, would you speak into us and through us today as a body, and may your word live in our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you're seated, greet those around you, welcome them, thank them for coming to church this morning. Many, many views on marriage and singleness. In fact, uh, you can look around uh, quite easily and find different people believe different things about different issues concerning these two topics. 
There are some that believe very firmly that every single person should be married in the church. There are some that believe that it's actually best if you don't get married, and it could be wrong to get married. And as we look at this text, as we look at this passage, uh, I want to be clear um, that we are going to look at this from a biblical perspective. We're not going to look at this from uh, Greg's personal opinion or maybe the world's opinion, because I think we've come to a place where the world has been very clear as to what they think that marriage and singleness should bring to a person, and that's happiness. Both. Whether you're married or whether you're single, the goal in either one is to be happy. Happiness is king. Happiness is what drives people to do the things that they do or not do the things they do. However, we're going to see that Scripture teaches the complete opposite. It doesn't teach that in marriage or in singleness you need to be miserable. But what it teaches is that in marriage and in singleness... There's a gift given by God that each one of us must recognize and grasp. Because not all of us are called to the same thing. We want to look at three different uh, instructions for married people in this text, and we're going to look at three instructions for those who are single in this text. But I I want to uh, kind of get clear as to what kind of demographic I'm speaking to this morning. If you would, would you raise your hand in here if you're married? Raise your hand and keep it up. Okay, so pretty good amount. Now keep your hands up if you're married. I want them to stay up. If you're single in here, if you're widowed, if you're not married, if you're not dating, if you are single, raise your hand. Okay, that should cover about the rest of you. All right, good. So now that we've established that every single person in this church is either married or single, we can relate to this text, right? There's not a point in here where you're going to be able to zone out and say, it has nothing to do with me. Because if you're not married, you may have the potential someday of getting married. And if you're married, you might think, well, this part on singleness has nothing to do with me. But I can guarantee you that there's people in your life that are single, and you have an opportunity to minister to them, and to be with them, and to walk with them in their singleness, whether they're called by God to be single, or they find themselves single. So we as a church have a complete demographic here of, of, I would say, pretty close to half married and half single, which is a good thing. So we're, we're going to hit this this morning. So our text starts out here in chapter 7, verse 1. Paul says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul begins this section by responding to something that was previously written to him. It says very clearly, concerning the matters about which you wrote. This is one of, uh, he he addresses this earlier when he talks to the church about the the, uh, issues about the man living with his stepmother, that's having an appropriate relationship with his stepmother. But later on in the book, he'll reference this three or four more times, that he's writing in response to something that was previously given to him. This is no difference. In, in, In fact, his quote when he says, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, is not Paul saying that. This is Paul saying what they've already said. This is in response to what they've already shared with him. There was a a section, a group of people within the church of Corinth that was very uh, pro-marriage. In fact, we saw that. They made pro-marriage to the wrong extent, where they would have seen marriage as a way to enact any sort of sexual deviancy or be able to uh, be immoral in whatever way they chose to. There's also a group in Corinth That was very anti-marriage. They would have said that marriage and and sex in general was wrong. It was not to be done. In fact, the highest and best way to live the Christian life would to be celibate your entire life. And these two groups were, were, as you can imagine, were very much at odds with each other as to what is the best way to practice and live out the Christian life. And Paul's addressing that in this letter. This section here in chapter 7 is not a section in a a marriage seminar that Paul's giving. He's addressing specific issues, and as we look at them, we can glean a lot of things from this that we can take home and be able to practice in our life as well. Corinth, as you know, was a city well known for its rampant immorality. And because of that, and because of the the city and the way that it was structured, uh, those two sides were very much in argument as to what what pursues the Christian life best, marriage or singleness. 
Now, we do know that if we go back to uh, creation, if we go back to the beginning, we know very clearly that God designed marriage. God designed the sexual relationship and intimacy between a husband and wife. So we know if God designed it, it's not bad, right? Therefore, we can't say with a blanket statement that it is good for a man or a woman not to be physically intimate with their spouse. We can say, based on Scripture and based on the whole of Scripture, that any deviancy from that model between a husband and wife in the marriage context, if there's sexual relationship or physical intimacy being hap- be, uh, happening with, without, outside of that, that model, it is wrong. And we see that very clearly throughout all of Scripture. So what we have to do this morning is we kind of have to flesh through this and look at this from the perspective that Paul is writing to these people, but also even in our current context, there's a lot of ways that marriage, within the marriage context, we can also be immoral. And there's a lot of ways within the single context that you can be immoral. And we need to look at those in, that, in light of what Paul just recently wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So, we're going to flesh this out a little bit. We're going to look at the first three instructions toward those who are married. And the first instruction Paul gives to the married couples, so if you're married in here, this is an instruction to you. If you're single in here, this is an instruction to you because you may possibly be married someday. The first instruction is to pursue purity. We are to pursue purity. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. He says, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. I think sometimes we like to put the concept of purity only on those who are single. I know it's easier, right? To say, well, if you're single, you need to remain pure until you get married. But purity runs throughout a Christian's life, no matter whether they're single or married. And Paul is very, very clear with that. It's also clear in multiple other sections of Scripture that that purity within marriage is to be observed and practiced. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28. You can jot that that reference down. There's a few of them here. I'm just going to read that quickly. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, saying, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Adultery happens, right, when a married man or a married woman has a physical intimate relationship with another married man or married woman or single man or single woman. They break fidelity within that marriage. Jesus says, you said, it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in her heart. Purity within marriage is highly regarded, even among Jesus who was single. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, let the marriage be held in honor among all and let, marriage, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-5, through 5, we looked at this a number of weeks ago where Paul is addressing an issue in the church where, a un, where, where an unmarried man is having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. And we see that even in that situation, Paul is saying that is not to happen. He says in verse 2, Ought you rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So marriage purity and purity within marriage is something that the Bible speaks very, very clearly of and we need to be very intentional of. Why? Because God intends it. It's part of the beauty of marriage. The commitment and love and fidelity to one person for the rest of your life. It's a beautiful thing, and it's not just for our good and our benefit. Marriage is a reflection of the church, of Christ's love for the church, and Jesus is not dating around or sleeping around with other ways to get people to come to him. Jesus is married to the church, and he wants a pure, spotless bride. We are a reflection of that in our marriages. As a married man or a married woman, your eyes and your desires are to be only for your spouse. That's it. And Paul says here that each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. We see a singular nature in that. Not multiple husbands and wives, which again, we might laugh at and think that's crazy. But in this context and day and age, this would have been pretty radical for a man and a woman not to have multiple partners or multiple uh, people within a marriage. 
But these two words, his own and her own, in the Greek are singular possessive verb, meaning that your wife is your wife, and your husband is your husband. They are created, they are intended for you, and you alone, and you for them. And within the confines of marriage, your own spouse means a fidelity to them, and purity within marriage means that your eyes, your heart, your emotions, and your body are for your spouse and them alone. You don't get to share those with anybody else. And I want to be very clear that purity within marriage does not just extend to physical intimacy. It does not extend to just that. We talked about this the last time I preached in in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Pornography is a huge issue. And it's become a massive issue within the church. Just the other day we heard a statistic. 70% of Christian men, professing Christian men, are dealing with pornography. That's a lot of people. That's a ton of people. But it doesn't just end there. We can't just say, well, pornography is the other issue of purity. We just stay away from that. No, there's so many more. There's emotional connections. Wives, this is a big one. Men that give you, give you attention that your husband doesn't, it can be easy to attach an emotional connection to that person. That is defiling your marriage covenant. That is being impure in your marriage. There can be also physical connection where a husband or a wife breaks their physical uh, intimacy with their husband or wife and moves to another person. Your thought life can also be a way that Satan tries to attack the purity of your marriage by thinking, well, this guy is much better looking than my husband, or this woman is, it would be a much better wife than my wife. And just consistently relaying those thoughts in your mind are ways to induce impurity into your marriage. And this concept that Paul's writing about here is is almost, in a sense, speaking of being owned by somebody else. If you're a husband, in a, in, a, in a sense, based on the Greek, you are actually owned by your wife. And if you're a husband, or if you're a wife, you're actually owned by your husband. There's a sense of ownership there because of the commitment and the level of commitment that was given. And this is vital to grasping the rest of what Paul's going to be talking about. Because the next few verses make no sense if you still think you're your own person. Okay? So we'll move into the second point. The second instruction that Paul gives here is to pursue partnership. He first tells us to pursue purity. Now he's telling us to pursue partnership. He says in verses 3 and 4, The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. The fact that a married couple is to pursue purity means that the husband and wife must be committed to a mutual giving sexual relationship. That's how this works. And to to the married couples in here, you have the unique, extremely unique, and biblical privilege to be the only human being on the face of this planet ever created before or after you that has that opportunity. To be able to give to your wife or to your husband and meet those needs, those physical and intimate needs. Genesis chapter 2, verses, verse 24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and, mother, or father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This happens through the union of sexual activity. Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 9, verse 9 says, Enjoy life with a wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. This phrase, enjoy life with your wife or the wife of your youth, different versions say different things, is in other words saying, enjoy your marriage relationship. Enjoy the sexual union that a husband and wife can share with each other all the days that you can. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. And if you really want a good book to read, I invite you to read the Song of Solomon. Because that entire book is a husband and a wife in a relationship that's going on within those two, and it's beautiful. It shows God's design for marriage and intimacy within marriage. 
And sex within the context of marriage between a man and a woman is a beautiful and God-designed act. And it is something that I believe very firmly that the church needs to take back. Because the world has done a phenomenal job of distorting it. And they've done a great job of infiltrating the church and the home with media, with our phones, in the workplace, anywhere you can find it. It's finding its way into our lives. And I believe that the church needs to take back the physical intimacy that God designed between a man and a woman in a beautiful and pure way. And we all know that whatever God designs, whatever God creates, the enemy wants to attack. And the enemy wants to take down or pervert or distort. And he's done that same exact thing with marriage. And brothers and sisters, I do believe that it is our responsibility to promote biblical intimacy between a husband and wife. Not just for the world's sake, but for your kids' sake. For the future of the church. For the young people that are looking to some of us who are older and who are married, who have experienced marriage, to be able to speak into that and share with them the beauty of what God's designed. Paul tells us here that when we submit our lives to each other in marriage, that we also submit all of us to the other person. Now I want to be clear, this, this passage has been used in a very abusive way. It's been used in an abusive way. I, I don't know the, where you guys are at with this, and I don't know if you've heard of different stories about this, but it has been used in an abusive way where a man or a woman will use this section of Scripture to, to basically force their husband or their wife to do things when they don't want to. And that is not what Paul is saying here. In fact, we, when we look at the biblical view of physical intimacy within a marriage, you have to look at the whole of Scripture. Right? We don't just take something out of context and say, there, that's, that's what this means and therefore you must do this. No, we look at the whole of Scripture because in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, we see a beautiful picture of how a wife is to submit to her husband. Why? Because God's asked you to, but also because the husband is to love the wife just as Christ has loved the church. So we have a mutual love and respect between husband and wife. And therefore, when it says that you shouldn't deprive one another of those sexual relationships, it's meant not to be used as a, as a uh, force, but as an opportunity and a blessing to serve, to lovingly serve your husband or your wife. Because the giving of ourselves to our spouse is to be done in a loving and a selfless way. Way. The third instruction we see here in verse 5 is that we are to pursue patience. It says, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Within a marriage, there will be times of physical distance. It happens. It happens. There can be health issues that may get in the way of physical intimacy between a husband and wife. There may be physical limitations that get in the way. There may be tiredness. There may be stress. There may be a lack of desire. There could be any reason that get in the way of a husband and wife being able to uh, interact and relate to each other physically. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. In fact, the word deprived that he uses is the Greek word apostero, which means and can be translated deprived, that's a, that's a very good translation of it. But to get to the root of the word, it actually means to defraud or to steal. Which gives it a whole other level. When you think of that word, do not deprive, you could say, don't steal from your husband or your wife the things that you are due to, due to give them. What he's saying is that a husband and wife is not to take away and use sex in physical intimacy as a weapon. Don't pull it away and withhold it and then only give it when it's good for you or when, it's, when they've deserved it or when they've been good enough. That's not what he's talking he's ta- he's, That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about just this, uh, the, the lack of desire or, or those seasons of life where it may happen. And that's okay. What he's saying is don't use it as a weapon. The only way it's good for a husband and wife to refrain from intimacy is by what the text says, by an agreement and limited time. Agreement and limited time. And it's not just for any purpose. Paul says to take time and during that time, devote yourselves to prayer. 
Use that time to bring yourself closer spiritually with, with your Savior and then come back together again. Don't just continue down that road. It's not healthy in a marriage relationship. Come back together again. There must be a reunion of the couple. And when intimacy is withheld for too long, Paul makes it very clear, it can lend a person to find other ways to access that. Because we are physical beings and we desire physical intimacy in the marriage context. And Satan knows this. He knows this very well. He knows where we're weak and he knows when we're weak. And he's not going to let up because you have decided to take a break. He's going to hammer you and he's going to be there. So come back together and reunite as husband and wife in intimacy. So brothers and sisters, let's make sure that our marriages are doing our best to pursue patience in those times that we refrain and not to use intimacy as a weapon. And there's so much more that we could talk about along these lines, but we can't because I'm supposed to close. I have three more points. And we're going to move through these quickly. Thankfully, because these points um, are three instructions for singles, and I'm I'm not doing it because I'm not single, and I'm not doing it because I think the singles are are less of value. I'm going to move through these points fairly quick because Paul actually takes a very extensive time later on in this chapter to deal with the issue of of singleness and how that works and and what God has for those who are single, and we're going to dive into this very deeply uh, in a few messages from now. So I do want to kind of just give a, a precursor to that with a few points. The first point and first instruction he gives to singles is that singleness can be a gift. It can be a gift. Paul says in verses 6 and 7 that is, uh, not, as a, not as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself as I myself am, which is single, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. And before we dive into this section, I want to share something very clearly with you as a church, and especially to those who are single. Not everybody who is single desires to be so. Not everybody who is single is is taking this as a gift from God. There are some who are single that desire to be married. And that's okay. That's okay. And there's a variety of factors that go into why somebody may be single and wish to be married. There's a variety of factors. And it's not up to us as a church to judge or to put blame on them or to make them feel less than because of that. It's, us as a, it's, it's our responsibility as a church to love them, to care for them, and to provide opportunities for service and to use their gifts within the body of Christ. Paul shares here that it is God who gives us gifts of either singleness or marriage. And specifically for singleness, he gives that gift. He can give it for a season or he can give it permanently. That's between you and God. You guys get to decide that together. That's not for Myron to figure out. That's not for Greg to figure out. That's not for your, your friends to figure out. That's for you to figure out. Has God gifted you with a gift of singleness? And that looks different for everybody. I'm not going to go too far in depth of that because we're going to get into that later. But he also might be just giving you that gift for a season. And later on, he may bring somebody into your life that he's called you to marry. Paul recognizes that some are gifted for marriage and some are gifted for singleness, but he also recognizes that neither are gifted to practice sexual immorality. Neither one. Whether you're married or single, you're not given a free pass to practice sexual immorality. And those who are gifted to be single doesn't mean that they won't be tempted or struggle with that. It doesn't mean that. However, in those times, if God has gifted you with the gift of singleness, you can be sure that God's grace will be sufficient and that he will supply all your needs. The scriptures promise that. They promise that. The second instruction Paul gives to singles is that singleness can be good. It can be good. And again, we're going to flesh this out later, but Paul says in verse 8, To the unmarried and to the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. And that can be good. And again, we'll flesh this out later. But there is distinct benefits to not being married that a single person can have. That can happen. Paul used his singleness to maximize his opportunities to share the love of Jesus with the, across the known world and with the church. Had he been married, he talks about this later on, it would have been much harder. And there's many things that divide your attention when you're married. 
But brothers and sisters who are single in the church, you have a value to Jesus, a, a massive value to Jesus and to the ministry of the church. We just have to figure it out. We just have to figure it out. And that can happen through many different ways. But don't let Satan or anyone else tell you that you're less of a Christian because you're not married. That's wrong. That's wrong. Because to use that logic would, to say Paul, would be to say that Paul was less of a Christian. Or that Jesus was less of a man because he wasn't married. That's not true. So don't let Satan tell you that. Use the time and the, the opportunities that you have to serve Jesus and his kingdom. You see, Paul found his value and identity in Christ, and it transformed his life. And whether you're single or you're ma- married, we must all do the same. We must all do the same. And the last instruction Paul gives to those who are single is that singleness isn't a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. It says in verse 9, But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. The gift of singleness may or may not be a lifetime deal for you. You don't know. You don't know. And, and there may be opportunities where you feel very comfortable being single. And it's a good thing for you to be single. And there may be a time down the road, and there may not be a time down the road, where God will bring somebody into your life that could change all of that. But if God has given you the gift of singleness, then continue in that until he decides to change it. Continue in that. If he has not given you that gift and you have the opportunity to marry, Paul makes it very clear, it's better you marry than to burn with passion. It's better to marry than to flirt with sexual immorality, or worse, practice it. He makes it very clear. I can also tell you that if you do pursue marriage as a single person, that you should not do so only for the physical intimacy that it will bring. Paul's not teaching that either. He's not teaching, well, if you, if you desire to have physical intimacy with, a, with another person, that you should just get married because that desire is there. That's not what he's teaching. Um, in fact, again, we look to the whole of Scripture to see what biblical marriage looks like, and that isn't one of the requirements. It's part of it. It's the blessing of marriage, but it's not one of the requirements. That shouldn't be the first thing that you go to. We get a whole picture. And marriage in itself is an act of self-denial and unconditional love for another person. So to go into it with just the aspect of physical intimacy being the reason, you'll be left very disappointed. Very disappointed. So, what's the big takeaway? How do we practice what this text says? A few things for you to think about. If you are married, seek to honor God in your marriage. If you are married, seek to honor God in your, in your marriage. And honor your spouse within that marriage as well. How do we do that? We do that by pursuing purity in that marriage. We do that by pursuing partnership in that marriage. And we do that by pursuing patience in our marriage. Seek to serve God in whatever situation or position in life or surroundings that you and your spouse find yourself in. That's how you can practice a good biblical marriage. If you are single, I'll address you with this thought. If you are single, seek to honor God with your singleness. Find ways to do so. Don't feel like you're less of a person or alone in a world of couples. It might feel that way. And again, we're going to deal with this at a later date where it's going to be much more in depth. Instead, see your singleness as a gift from God, whether it be for the present time or for the, for the rest of your life. See this time as a gift from God and ask him how you would be able to serve him with that gift. What's the best way for me to use my singleness? How can I be a blessing to God and his church? And you may find opportunities available to you that you might have never seen possible if you were married. So trust God with your life. Seek to serve him with the gifts he has given you. And I think we need to remember very clearly in all of this, especially as Christians, that each and every one of us must rely every single day on the grace that only Jesus can give through the gospel. I don't like a sermon to just be a list of do's and don'ts. Because to me, that's just a law. And I don't like that. The Bible is very clear that we live in grace. We live by grace. And because of that, we have the opportunity as Christians to experience the regenerative power of the gospel each and every day in our marriages and in our singleness. 
doing and practicing these things, whether it's in your marriage or in your single state, will not make you a better Christian. They're not going to draw you closer to Jesus, and they're not going to make you somebody who God loves more. And they're certainly not going to make you more righteous. Because we gain all our identity in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. That's the only way we find fulfillment in this life, whether married or single. And each one of us, whether you're married or single, needs to recognize that. Because if we're looking to our spouse for that, you're going to be disappointed very quickly. If you're looking as a single person to the opportunities that you can have or the freedom that you have, you're going to be disappointed awful quickly. We need Jesus. We need his gospel and we need his love and and grace in our life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for this text. We thank you for the challenges that it presents and for the, the questions that it presents, but also for the hope that it presents. Thank you, Jesus, that you, have came, that you came to this earth and that you have defeated death and sin. And, and because of that and that you rose from the grave, we can have freedom. We can have identity. And I pray that this morning over this church. That our church would have freedom and identity in you. Whether we're married or whether we're single, we, we trust God that you and you alone will be the one who we look to to fulfill our needs, to supply our needs, and to give us the strength that we need each and every day. God, we thank you for those who are married in this church. We thank you for the testimony that they have for you in their marriage, the opportunity that they have to share the gospel in their marriage. And God, we thank you for those in our church who are single, who are, who are not married or maybe never going to get married or, or maybe will get married down the road. We just pray, God, that you would work through them. Grant them avenues and areas where they can experience your love and grace in fresh and amazing ways. Be able to use their gifts and talents and the time that they've been given to be able to serve you and the church. And all of this, God, we give you the glory. And we thank you for the amazing work you've done in our lives. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.